From David Zwerner, this is Dialogues, a podcast about artists and the way they think. I needed to create spaces that were my standard, even if that standard was completely fantastical or totally out of this world. I don't feel at home in the world very much. It, it can be like a really hideous experience. So I wanted to make a place uh, where I could be at home. I'm Lucas Werner, and every episode features a conversation. We're taking artists, writers, philosophers, designers, and musicians, and putting them in conversation with each other to explore what it means to make things today. This episode's pairing, the artist Alex DeCorte and the writer Charlie Fox. So Charlie and Alex, first of all, just thank you for doing this. Maybe the first thing, Charlie, you've for a long time been interested in a kind of fantasy realm or at least in the kind of mm -hmm. self-transformation. Yeah. And, and I'm curious how that began. So like, where does the, I would say, the monster interest uh, come The from? interest in monsters. Yeah, <laughs> that's deep. I mean, like... It's so it's so deep. Hang right. on, let me think. I need to have like a, a classy origin story here, or an unclassy. One, how I actually. became a, how I became a monster. A, a classless. Yeah, origin. a classless story, a dirty story, <laughs> exactly. filthy a story. story. I don't know, man. Like, I mean, I remember like. Um, like I, when I was like five or six, like on the weekend, I would like dress up like a vampire and like have like blood running down my face, fake blood, and just kind of stalk around in my parents' back garden, like fully devoted to like this thing of being a vampire or, you know, looking at like getting like a werewolf mask in the post and like just sitting in my room wearing that and just feeling like really good. Were your, was your family, your mother or father, were they into horror movies or... No, I don't think so. I mean, no, I don't know. Like, they didn't, um, they didn't discourage it. And they were, I was really into Disney as well. And I really liked the scary parts of Disney. And I think my, that freaked my mom out a little bit. She thought that was a bit, like, odd. Like, to be, to really, like, be into Cruella de Vil as, like, a figure. And I think that she I was... I can relate. Like, I can relate to that. Yeah, they're I the think... most fun. Yeah, they're exactly. having the most fun. They are. They're having fun. They're really, like, they're apart from the normal world. You know what I mean? Right. They're, you know, they're these figures who are, like, fuck you, I'm going to do this. Like, Cruella de Vil's going to go and live off in, like, Hell Hall, her amazing house with the dying trees that looks like something from like a Roger Corman Poe film or whatever, and just sit in bed and smoke cigarettes and like dream of that they want to be. She wants to be an artist or whatever. That she wants to make this amazing garment. It's like the red shoes. It's like Edward Scissorhands. I'm just thinking like, yeah, I do remember rewatching the trailer for Edward Scissorhands on VHS so much that the tape wore out. And I really like the thing of being scared by these people and and being drawn to them at the same time. I knew that it was a kind of love that I was feeling for them that I didn't get off these regular people. Like I wouldn't get off of like Hercules in the Disney film because he was just like a hunk. And I didn't, because I had, you know, problems with and still have problems with my body, like, you know, physical ailments and conditions and things. So I always felt even on some, you know, unconscious level like not like a level that you purposely feel but you know a certain world isn't accessible to you like a world of an ordinary world where you can maybe run really fast or do certain things with your hands or like you know know how to tie up your shoes or something which is something i still don't know how to do my hands don't work well enough for me to do that like it just precludes you from certain things and so you have to kind of create your own royalty and and fall in love with these other figures so like every time i see the devil from fantasia or i see you know boris karloff as frankenstein my heart like throbs in a delicious and disturbing way and i like that feeling how i came to your guys friendship or came to sort of discover it was this mm. piece that you wrote about frankenstein and about slow graffiti i think in the new york times right was it was a times mm -hmm. piece yeah you talked a lot about how that might be that there's something about queerness in that Frankenstein character. And there's something about that distancing and that sort of intense romance and tragedy that's being captured and maybe even sort of like in a, in a larger sense mm. um, could be identified with a character like that. I mean, that's, that's a great tradition of that, you know? There's a long, long history of, of there being these kind of other families. I mean, the Adams family or the Munsters or, you know, 
to give like the really trashy example. Or Deanne Arbus. Or Deanne, Deanne Arbus. Arbus. Yeah. I mean, I, I shouldn't bad mouth the monsters. They rule. So did the Adams family. And I mean, like, um, yeah, Deanne Arbus and John Waters' films are all about these other families and these kind of carnival families where these misfits can all live together in a kind of world which is apart and separate from, you know, the um, tyranny of normality the tyranny of like good taste paris is burning yeah I paris mean. is burning and is that something alex that you think of i mean so much of your work i feel is also creating these other realities right where things don't work even the objects that we recognize i remember being in your studio and seeing these benches the bench has a light on it the bench is not to be sat in and the world is not colored the way we typically expect worlds to be colored the house doesn't function the way whether it was the the, the haunted house you know, doesn't function that way. Are you sort of aware of constructing this totally other realm or wanting to inhabit it when you make the work? I think if you have ever been marginalized, you get used to living on the periphery and understanding how the center, how the, the normative behavior is works, how it functions. Um, and you recognize that that function isn't for you necessarily. And the best thing that maybe one can do if they have ever been marginalized is to accept that difference and not even try to to level it, to, to accept the difference and, and, and sort of relish in maybe the dysfunction or relish in what is your normal. And so I don't see a chair with a light on it as absurd or unnormal or, or against the standard, I think of it as just a hopeful proposition for what is m my reality. How do you cultivate, I would I would even say, the, the sort of strength to stay the course, you know? Like, I mean, I think that is what is so powerful about the show that you've curated at Sadie Cole. It's this mm -hmm. sort of like consistent, or your book, This Young Monster, mm -hmm. This of consistent vision for something else. It's good if it makes like the regular people or whatever makes them nervous or question their idea of what normal is or makes them realize that the idea of being normal is like a flimsy hologram or something. Do you know what I mean? Like that there is like nobody's body is safe. There's something wrong with everybody's body and everybody has these like, you know, dark thoughts or weird thoughts is definitely like you know there are bats in everybody's attic or whatever it's definitely the truth so it's nice in a way to like draw people into this world and make it very seductive and delicious um even if some of the stuff in there is disturbing but i think everything is i think it's all beautiful it's just maybe not like a kind of traditional beauty that people are fed by these like sort of the, it's a kind of analgesic beauty of like this is a sunset that is obviously gorgeous and it's like every other sunset that you've seen and it turns it into a kind of banal thing which you just use to be like to just have some idea of like that's what taste is or whatever and the thing I like hate most of all is just being in the world in like a sort of numb way like I'm trying to make like these delicious kind of perverse worlds where these unruly things can happen these, these weird creatures can come out and play i don't feel at home in the world very much do you know what i mean like walking along or walking down the street or whatever like you know it, it can be like a really hideous experience so i wanted to make a place uh where i could be at home you know you have chosen to work in a very specific place uh in philadelphia uh, in a specific part of philadelphia um is that a place where you feel at home is there sort of like but you what i mean is you've avoided many of the more mainstream i would say aside from when we were at yale together like since then basically you have not engaged i mean you, you know as readily or in your everyday life with the kind of predictable or more normal way of being from i mean for me philadelphia is just where my family is from so that makes sense to me you know um and i i moved around quite a bit when i was younger so like where what? uh well i grew up in uh, venezuela in caracas venezuela and i lived for a bit of time in pittsburgh and and then in the suburbs of new jersey and the suburbs of philadelphia and i guess uh that sort of ricocheting that occurs as a young person when you're 
trying to find your trying to get your sea legs I think uh and you're moving around a lot and for me I'm very um I get very attached to spaces uh I'm just very sentimental towards objects and how they are and it's a it's a tendency that I have where I really care a lot about about um just the material things I needed to create spaces that were my standard even if that standard was completely fantastical or totally out of this world and so I still go to that space. So for me to be in Philadelphia is fine. I could be anywhere. But there's a kind of generative space for me to it, it, there's a literal um physical space that's allowed for me to make these kind of fantastical worlds and have that be my my anchor. Kind of safe space. Mm-hmm, yeah. 100%. And it definitely feels I mean for both of you to me it feels like the studio space and even your shows I mean, the show you cured, but the shows that you put on are also kind of like creating a home for yourself on some level. I mean, it does, is that sort of a fair? Yeah, I mean, I was, I've was i been thinking about that Deborah Cox song, Nobody's Supposed to Be Here. And the, the very first two lines are, how did you get in? Nobody's supposed to be here. And I think about that in relationship to the film Halloween, you know, because the film starts out and Michael Myers is looking into this house and you, the viewer, are looking into a house. And then the camera moves into the house, and you participate with this vicious thing inside of the house. And then when the camera pans out, you realize that you are this inhabitant of the house as well. You're this child in this house. And I can really relate to that idea of wanting to be in or wanting to be to be a part of that center, whatever that normative space is. It's what you want as a, a young participant that feels like an outsider, like it feels like a queer outsider. And so I kind of rush towards that in some ways, but that's, I understand that that's not, that ideal is not worth rushing towards. So I'll make a new ideal or a new standard. And that is what these worlds are, I think. I mean, I think what's amazing about both of these worlds or homes that are constructed is that they're they're extremely inviting. Yeah, I mean, I just, I hate stuff that's like, clinical or is designed to withhold pleasure you know what i mean enough things exist in the world to which, withhold yeah which don't give me pleasure or i find torturous or boring or whatever what would be some of those things what would be some of those things oh man there's so many cars like i just just like looking at a car is just depressing to me cars like um, cheese, like you don't like cheese. I don't I hate cheese. Man. You hate cheese. Yeah, I hate cheese. Oh like, man, like, I know, and I know that I I'm missing out. On a, <laughs> missing out on a whole galaxy of pleasure, which I like. I understand. I hate the word. I hate the color. Like, do you know what I mean? I hate the color. I hate um banks. So many things. Like, it's not like a. I don't have a considered list of hates. I should be really principled and say like I hate something of. I hate things that are yeah just designed to be like numbing agents or whatever. Fuck all these things that don't give me pleasure. I really want to do something that may, that is like um almost like a drug, like a drugged reality, like a, a heightened like a hallucination of the world or like a world that doesn't exist so that you have to make it real so that you can like, you know, live inside it and feel good in there. Even with propositions of spaces that are seductive or psychedelic, there can be critique there is there's ways to to pull you in and then to zap you for me to present a a a space that is actually really garish or really overly saturated or overly saccharine um is one way to say maybe your taste isn't what you thought or also to privilege bad taste i mean that's what john waters does It's, it's sort of like to kind of embrace the things that are taboo or the things that scare you because what is a world that keeps out taboos or things that scare you? Mm-hmm. Uh, to me, that's a really boring fucking world. What is the interest in sugar? You know, like, it it feels like that's something that just became an obsession of some kind. Mm-hmm. The the work that, we're, that you're referring to, which I sort of, I did maybe 10 plus years ago, um, was this work where I was um, cooking down bottles of two liters soda, Coca-Cola and cherry Coke. And in its distillation, the color would be, would become really saturated and also become a syrup. And I would paint these, these Vaseline walls, little, little, um, 
essentially dams of Vaseline that would kind of keep this water, this yeah, this sort of syrupy stuff um, from spilling over um, certain edges, and I would kind of make these floor maps. And my first interest in this idea of pouring on the floor was just kind of questioning um, how one lives in a space, how one keeps their bodies in a space. And that like, we're just so thin, our skin is so thin. It's just a thin layer around a bunch of blood and meat and ooze and that it could just explode. And that the same could be said for a two liter bottle of Coke. You know, there's just this thin piece of plastic containing in this 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 color or this 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 liquid. And what does it mean to resist that that structure, to resist a standard and say, I'm gonna pour this all over the fucking floor and just let it be? And so that was where that work kind of developed. Is there sort of like an, an erotics to the monster world? Do you know what I mean? Like is there is there an attract is there an I mean I'm obviously gonna say yes. <laughs> But like, what, what does yes. it? But what? Yeah. How does it manifest? Like the Beast in Beauty and the Beast, you know, the cocktail version and the Disney version. Like, he's hot. You like you know, like you know it, and she knows it too. And the tragedy of that film is when he reverts back to being like just a white blonde dude. Like, it's a thing of huge sorrow to me still. I still feel like when I was a child and I would watch it, I would be very like distressed by that ending that he becomes this. I was like, why can't she just marry the beast? She spends all the time falling in love with the beast, you know, and then for that to be taken away, it's just cruel and unusual. Charlie, and, did I ever tell you about uh, how I had all of the Disney villains painted on my bedroom wall? No. Oh, man. So when I was like 10, 11, 12, it, it went on for years. It was sort of my like version of... Mm -hmm. Michelangelo's frescoes and Sistine yeah. Chapel mm -hmm. but it was just the Disney villains painted in my bedroom mm -hmm. and the one sort of outlier that never made sense to me was that I painted the beast on the wall and I and people would say he's not the villain and I mm -hmm. thought but he kind of is sometimes mm -hmm. he's just not constantly the villain but yeah. maybe he's sometimes the villain mm -hmm. but that that was like sexy and attractive to surround yourself with these yeah flamboyant mm. baddies like edward scissorhands again which is again like another mutation of that same tale you know is about you know an artist on one level you know that he is he's there making art for the family and there's a great moment when or making art for this suburb and then there's the great moment where the like redhead like housewife who's trying to bang all the mechanics or whatever comes down and they look at, she's like, like looking at him all smoldering Johnny Depp, like cutting this dog's fur or whatever. And she goes like, oh, he's a perversion of nature. Isn't that exciting? Like, yes. <laughs> like that woman knows what's up. Like that is like the most, such a powerful moment. You know what I mean? Like, cause that's true. Like the, these things that disturb you, they're, to me, often the things that I'm drawn to are things that, like, at first I'll be like, holy shit, like, what is that? Like, it really kind of freaks me out or I don't like it or I feel like it's wrong or tasteless. And then I go, like, towards those things and try and eat them up because uh, cause I know that really that that's, like, the first, like, shock of love. If it's, like, just uh, the first shock of love. Yeah, the first shock of love. <laughs> it's like you can hear the 80s drums just... <laughs> Pounding the underneath their front, the shock of love. Like no, I mean, but you, that to me is like the first big hit. Like it's again, it's like a weird combo of stuff. I wish I'd had the Disney um, villains on my bedroom wall. Yeah. What I had was Jack Nicholson as the uh, as the Joker. It's sort of a question for for both. But what were kind of like sources of ero of like erotic excitement early on, like in a develop in developing sexuality? Just because I think so much of there's like a there's a real acceptance of what was exciting to each of you or what continues to be exciting to each of you. I feel it in the work in a way. Like sometimes when I look at your videos, I think that there there's something about what you're doing which is sort of like exciting to you to watch and exciting to us. You know, and I think especially interesting when you're a straight white guy to sort of like watch the video and be like, there's something really exciting here. And I don't know how to access it necessarily, but I can absolutely feel it, right? I can feel it pulling me in. I mean, like, in a way, like, when you're a child, I, don't, I mean, like, the, all the excitements kind of come together in one sort of delicious ooze. So there may have been things that I was, like, getting off on in a way that I could no longer 
you know achieve like in a way like the like chocolate in like a sandwich there was something about that that was you know overpowering like a chocolate spread or like sandwich. nutella or something yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah that yeah, stuff yeah. like and just like that or like put or like like certain like flowers like i had a real like secret thing that i was really into like as a child which is also something that homer simpson does where i like to sort of pretend flowers were food and just kind of eat them like just randomly i really like that so i probably was like erotically drawn to to flowers but it's almost like there's a continuity i think that's maybe the interesting thing that yeah. For most of us, there's a very clear division between sort of like what you're interested in mm. and what's arousing. Yeah. Right. I mean, and, and for you guys, it seems actually pretty fluid. It's like interest can become yeah. directed in a different way. I mean, if I think about, again, the movie Halloween, and I think about Jamie Lee Curtis, and as a young gay man watching that film, for me, I wasn't attracted to Jamie Lee, but I was attracted to the idea that someone would want me that much that they'd want to come and kill me or that they'd want to follow me to the end of time, say. Not the killing part, but mm. she had that kind of appeal and then Michael's the person who stalked her. So for me, it made sense to put myself in her position and say, oh, this is this way that this person will come to me. This is what this, this kind of flip, this is where this flip happens. To be desired by someone else that's maybe a monster too mm -hmm. the werewolf in american werewolf in london i also had him on my wall like picture of him mid transformation like screaming that was really attractive to me i really understood that the beast i didn't really understand why i was drawn to these figures you know it took me a long time to figure out why that might be but i just felt like um drawn to them and you know like i really i really loved them but it also has, it's like not, gen, it's not gendered really, no, right? No, it's no. like, it doesn't matter if they're, the, it's really more about the beast and less about it being a male beast or a female, yeah. Mm. But I mean, it's interesting for something like, say the, the cartoon character from Lion King, Scar. So I was really into the Scar, like I thought he was a, just a cool and seductive mm. figure. But going forward, you find out that there's this animator who made it was also queer. And so, you know, I had no idea. Andreas yeah. Deja, and here he's kind of putting himself in this figure. And all the characters that I was kind of find, finding myself attracted to wow. were people of his, his making. Whoa. And so then you kind of realize, oh, I'm folded up into this sort of, this kind of path towards a fantasy that maybe we might share in common. I was thinking, you know, Charlie talked a little bit about his childhood or at least aspects of... And I was curious if you, Alex, would say sort of like what it was like, what the world was like for you growing up. Like you talked about one of your one of your parents is Venezuelan or both of them are. My father is. Father. And what that, if that played a role, does it play a role now? I mean, it's interesting. I'm sure you've thought about that is that, you know, you present as white to a, at least to a, like I think it's, it's there. there's no like racial ambiguity, but actually there is. Mm -hmm. a biracial yeah you know the, sort of like that is your re that is your reality yeah and i guess i'm curious about if that was something that if that felt present when you were growing up and then if there's any way it's present now yeah it absolutely did um you know my mother is from new jersey and growing up in caracas venezuela this idea to be totally displaced and to not speak the language and then learn the language and then to come back to a place where now you've developed and a language separate from the the spoken language of the town and to feel like an outsider again um totally kept me on my toes it totally kept me wondering where is my place what is my race what is my who is who who are my people you mm -hmm. know who is similar to me that i can relate to and have you found that at all i mean like, do you feel you found a community I don't know, not in a sort of lame like, community, but like, do you feel like there's a set of people or a number of people that make you feel most comfortable? Yeah, I have my, I have my, my Paris is burning. You know, <laughs> I have, I have my Philadelphia is burning. Right. Um, and that, and that's where I stay. You know, right. that's where I, I have, I, that's where all of my garden is, you know, right. and I'm happy to be a part of that garden. Um, but it took some time. 
you know, it definitely took some time to not feel like alone or not feel like an outsider. Is that was that refinding Philadelphia that sort of made that happen? Like after school or I think it's just about the world becoming more accepting of of difference and or or maybe this I mean this is not totally true, but there's the hope that maybe people are and so you push forward. But of course there's still challenges. I mean that feels a little bit like the question of accepting of difference or at least interest in difference. I mean, that's a little bit the premise of this young monster. The, the idea that the monster as a character is more and more someone that people are thinking or like is, is, is in our mm -hmm. psyches in some way. Yeah. I mean, when did, did you realize that that was how your interest has obviously come mm, forever it's deep, it's deep and it's personal yeah. and there are many reasons. And, mm -hmm. but you know, at what point did you realize, Oh shit, actually this thing that I've been interested in for a long time, interested in for a long time is actually, getting yeah. attention as it were or um it wasn't like a move i was at home watching a clockwork orange um like and i was like 23 or 24 i was watching clockwork orange and uh the line just happens in the film when alex goes home alex de large not our alex right. <laughs> in the in the like the alex in the in alex's shot by shot remake uh -oh. of a clockwork orange <laughs> Which His is forthcoming, <laughs> which is which is you know never gonna be made. I'd say, <laughs> but like, you know, I mean, uh, I was just like I was watching it, and there's the line when um, Malcolm McDowell goes home and he's had his behavioral treatment and he's been fixed, and the so supposedly fixed by this aggressive therapy and viewing these films and everything. And then there's a lodger in his old house, in his parents' house. There's now this guy, and he refers to Malcolm McDowell as this young monster. And as soon as I heard those three words, I was like, oh, shit, that's what my book will be about, which I had no intention of writing a book at that point. You know what I mean? I was just going out and like, you know, smoking cigarettes and barking at ambulances or whatever I was doing. Like, do you know what I mean? It's just I wasn't thinking about like doing a book, but it just suddenly became inevitable that that's what it would be. And I knew that the form would change I, and it would do these things. And it was just the right thing it became like an unmovable thing in my head of like yes this will be like the meat like do you know what i mean i will like this is what i will be like into thoroughly and i realized that i was so it was almost like i've been so steeped in it for such a long time that i didn't even notice like it was the air or whatever the mon like the monsters and stuff you know that they were just always there and and then all of a sudden they like activated for me in a different way and uh, I, you know, went into that world. I would say that I was a totally different person by the time the thing was finished because I had, um, I mean, because I had been through, like, you know, heavy things with my own body and, and all of this stuff and feeling like huge alienation just from my own body and maybe, and in some way, my own taste, that I knew I was repressing a lot of things, maybe before I started working on the book and things were maybe like that perversity was there, that like evil was still there and something that sort of delicious evil, but the book fully allowed it to like be like this bird or whatever, this thing that was then unleashed, like the sort of host body died and the monster came out. It came out. Like, do you know what I mean? Like there was a, there was another part of me that was like wrong and then that died and I had like just a different kind of courage by the time it was done. Like, you know, I had like the, the werewolf transformation had occurred and I could allow all of this stuff to, to come out because it was horrible walking around knowing that you're repressing these things. I'm wondering if you, Alex, had like, if there was a moment or, or some project or something that, because you also feel to me now as a person when I'm with you that there's there's no struggle to be anything other than you are, right? And 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 that's a simple thing to say, but it's not true of man. Like I wouldn't say I'm there fully, you know, but I think I'm attracted, drawn to people who seem to be there more, you know? And I think a lot of people are governed by many more fears um, about what would happen if they let those defenses down and just accepted whatever came. Yeah, I think that if... Um... If you kind of see death really closely, um, 
and see real tragedy closely, it kind of sh shakes you. You know, it sort of reminds you that that what other, whatever hang up you have or whatever kind of feeling of difference that keeps you down is to be put aside because our time is limited and to just own what you got just own it and and rise above whatever fucking bullshit is being thrown your way and was i mean and I certainly don't have to answer that but is there something you're thinking about in terms of sort of that intimate moment not in any specifics but was there like a, a moment of closeness to tragedy or something intense that yeah i would say there's been a couple yeah countless yeah countless moments for you yeah yeah, 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 yeah. for me for sure for and sure but but seeing um i think seeing you know i i was thinking about my father and thinking about his relationship to his family in caracas venezuela and having left um, he, you know, he's the first person to come to the States uh, from his family and to spend his, his you know, young adulthood here uh, and start a family, but always be thinking about that distance mm -hmm. and always thinking back to his family that he wasn't with. And as those pieces of his family go away, what was maybe missed or what, what gaps could have been bridged between them? Um, and I kind of try to think about that in my day to day to kind of squash those gaps or mm. or connect with the people I can and to not let fear govern my my existence, you know, even and so which is maybe why I'm largely attracted to fear as a, a language that I operate in to, mm. to sort of insist upon confronting the things that that keep me in my place maybe you think when you say it's sort of a language for you are you think like what what would be an example of sort of deploying fear you know i'm just curious how you imagine like when you say fear what are you are you talking about sort of characters or scenarios or um i think it's about you know i'm, I'm a, like i'm a wallflower right. yeah I, uh, this is this isn't is makes me this makes me scared you right, know this right, is right, hard right. for me interesting um leaving my house is hard for me mm. you know i'm like yeah largely you like that too yeah yeah, 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 yeah. you know I i'm like a, yeah. i feel agoraphobic on days you know i'm mm. totally like it's a brave new world every day wow for me so that that kind of my mind is a kind of it's a wild place sometimes yeah, right so yeah. that there's a certain kind of like consistence to have to confront it and wow. and go mm. into the world, I think. Yeah, like anxiety is a big cauldron of stuff. It's definitely like that. A, you're stewing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, constantly. I mean, there's a lot of anxiety, and anxiety is a kind of negative excitement or whatever, like a weird, like reverse, like a sort of bad lightning or whatever that happens inside you. In the same way that when you get really excited about something, a lot of great titles from Bad Lightning. <laughs> bad great. Lightning. That's the name of my drug <laughs> yeah, that I'm going to do. Lightning. Bad Lightning. Only you take have it to if you're Charlie it. Fox. <laughs> just like sit there and just be snorting Bad Lightning all day. <laughs> but sorry, but, but like, but, yeah, anxiety is a huge thing. Um, have you always, is that something that you've always have, yeah. sounds like clinical, struggled with, but like oh, it's, it's been present. Clinical is fine. I mean, like I'm, I'm very happy with like, I mean, my, my mom is a doctor. Right. She still is a doctor. And, uh, you know, I grew up around medical stuff in a very heavy way. And it was great and a huge, huge influence and in all the stuff that, um, like, that there would be these, she would get copies of the British Medical Journal delivered every week. She still gets it. And they have photographs of people with different conditions in them. You know, it's just a standard thing of, like, a particular kind of lesion or a, or scars or a skin condition or whatever. And that they would just be, like, I would be, like, eating cereal and, like, looking at those pictures and just taking it as a very normal thing. Because you grew and also you grew like, people were dying all the time or people were getting sick. And you were always just very aware of, like, mortal stuff. And the, the condition of the body is almost to be wrong all the time. The body's almost always like in this kind of condition of like hideousness or being kind of off or needing to be medicated or something. And then obviously, I mean, that kind of combined with my own like going to hospital all the time and stuff like that. So it's a very like familiar world and gives you a very like different understanding of 
the body and what the body is that the body can be you know um devious and hideous and unfaithful to you and not even work for you i mean yeah parts of my body you know still don't work very well uh, you know like locking a door can cause anxiety yeah you know, going but to then, the, then going it, to it the sort of, supermarket it causes you it ca- that, mm. i think that's like what this thing is about then embracing this this kind of politics of fear or something that mm. then you say well if this thing that is supposed to to be my vessel and 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 is the thing that's supposed to carry me through here and it's let me down mm. then fuck it what is the standard you know yeah and really exactly then exactly say well let's have a let's have a ball with all these right. other things mm. that that freak but, you know, I was thinking about with the medical journal when you're talking about the you mm. know, getting that every day and seeing the bodies and seeing yeah. the bodies in states of the, and yeah. sort of this idea that that, that can be normal, that yeah. that is one of the, la- let's put it this way, that's one of the last frontiers uh-huh. of where there is very little acceptability. Like people who are ill mm. are not accept, you know, are not mm. being included and accepted most of the time. And illness is one of the things that I think we have the hardest time, yeah. especially in this country, Mm-hmm. Um, making real space for whatever the illness might be, and mm. and actually, frankly, just looking at it, yeah, right? like it's like we're starting to look at now many more things that have been ignored forever, mm-hmm. basically, whether it's things having to do with sexuality or race, mm-hmm. but it's like illness, you know, or what what Deanne Arbus calls freaks, you know, yeah, people don't want yet it feels like to be confronted with that, and it feels like that's a bit of the impetus. Maybe not mm. not in a moral sense for some yeah. of what you're doing, but it kind of like just look, you know, like yeah. here it is. Look, I mean, that's yeah. the mortal mirror. Yeah, that mm. is the... yeah, right. That actually looking at that is the, is the thing we should be looking at most in a way mm. because it's operative all the time, mm-hmm. right? Like what you're saying is like the body's always yeah degrading in some way, or there's always something wrong, and but there mm. is this culture of non admission, right? Yeah. Like, don't don't let that be because there's a culture of this of constant catering you know it's constantly making everything easier mm-hmm. you know you can get your food in an instant you don't have to wait no more lines mm-hmm. convenience convenience but like there's still this thing about the body yes that yeah. is material yes mm-hmm. you can't get away from it yeah but you can't get out of it do you know what i mean like you can you can try in a way you know there are these there are these ways to escape your own body but ultimately you know you're always in it this this like cage of meat and like people you know that like meat another cage. great meat another cage. great title that's a cool club meat cage <laughs> meat cage is like the yeah. nightclub by the end of this it's like it's like a nightclub where like it's it's very hardcore in the meat cage <laughs> and like maybe like slayer is playing like over the top and there's like he- flames around the door that's that's a, that's a, I mean it's funny I hadn't thought about, I mean, no, the meat cage thing obviously is funny, but I was really trying to say that I hadn't really, you know, when you, when your body's working for you mm. most of the time in a normal way, mm-hmm. you don't, it's not thematized for you in with the same level of kind of intensity. And I think that like my, my body is hard to use and I have to acknowledge that all the time. I think that there's like some kind of, idea maybe people assume that i'm getting off on this stuff in like a kind of a nasty you know like snotty way or something of just like oh look at these people who are you know hideous or whatever or perverse and it's just like it's a kind of um sickly thrill for me or something you know what i mean and um that isn't really the case that you know like i feel like a lot of a deep empathy like even like the spider you know that alex um that's at the haunted house show that alex made the spider being crushed by the huge boot that's like cowering i know alex hates spiders so i shouldn't bring this up and bring another anxiety into the collect the meat cage threesome (laughs) but like i feel i feel like a huge i feel empathy for the spider getting crushed you know when i or when i look at like the dn arbus kid with the clawed hand holding the hand grenade like i totally understand what's going on in that kid's head i don't look at it and think like oh that's strange do you know what i mean i i really like i feel that i feel like th- at that point like if i was to turn on the tv i wouldn't see somebody like me necessarily maybe the last last thing i want to sort of just ask about in general and see where it goes is just movies right because there's yeah. some, both of you have a sort of real deep love 
for movies of all kinds, mm -hmm. uh, horror in particular. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but I guess in, in, in the context of this conversation about, you don't typically watch movies where anyone like a Deanne Arbus character is being represented in any way, right? I mean, mm. it, that's not the common experience of mm. moviegoer. And so how do you reconcile the fact that sort of like a, probably a lot of the movies that you're watching, even that you like, uh -huh. have have nothing to do with exploring that i mean i'm sure some of them do but yeah i guess as a mainstream medium you don't see those bodies those characters that stuff mm. as readily you know yeah maybe more and more you do maybe or, you do yeah yeah maybe yeah maybe uh, i'm wrong um, about that yeah, yeah i'm mm. trying to think of i mean of course all the movies examples. that you're going to mention are of course ones where characters like that exist <laughs> yeah. as i was saying it i was yeah. like but of course all of charlie's <laughs> movies are about these beast like yeah. characters and you can always you can always find these the things in in this work or whatever or in like a movie that maybe you know there can be like furniture can be perverse you know right. are you gonna be watching a movie and like looking at like you know but that's kind of what i wanted to get at that yeah both of you i think can look at a film and see this sub something subversive or subvert the normal yeah, yeah, thing yeah, 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 yeah. by obsessing Fine. or sinking energy into like cathecting an object yeah. so intensely that yeah. suddenly it's like that thing turns the whole movie on its head. I can head. tell you what sense. my favorite example of that is recently. I was watching Meet the Parents a while ago, which I love that movie. It's a great movie, great comic set pieces. I was really hung over and watching Meet the Parents for like the thousandth time. And there's an incredible moment when uh, they're playing volleyball and in the pool at like Owen Wilson's house. And Ben Affleck wants to be like, get not Ben Affleck, Ben Stiller. <laughs> That's a different movie, the Stiller moment. But there's this moment when he goes to, sp he spikes the ball, the volleyball, and like breaks his sister in law's nose with this huge spike ball. And then the whole family like dives over to save his sister in law. His mother jumps in the pool, and Ben Stiller is left on the other side of this net with a whole family around. And then like on the other side of this thing, and he's desperate and heartbroken. And then Robert De Niro turns and it's a first person shot and he looks at Ben Stiller, but he's looking at you and he does this like repulsed face. And that's like an amazing, amazing thing to be like confronted. That's like some kind of like Kafka level, like horrific nightmare. Like the father looking at you, looking at you horrified, like you grotesque thing. And that you're forced in that position into this, Pool. And then I was doing some like background thinking about it or research on it. And like the director said, like, that movie is not a comedy. That movie is an anxiety dream that you're watching. It's a romance set within an anxiety dream. All of the like set pieces are all like weird. Like there's shit everywhere. There's a cat like pissing on some ashes or whatever. They're completely horrific, anxiety making, nightmarish set pieces that all just follow sequentially. It's like being in the sweatiest, darkest fever dream. You know, that's wonderful to me. Like, yeah, to see stuff like that going on. These little moments of like mainstream entertainment giving you something you know a different really kind of creepy. entertainment yeah and kind of a, that, like to know like to maybe to a lot of people that wouldn't be entertaining they wouldn't think about that but there's something so deep about the idea of like your father scowling at you this man scowling at you when and you're in this kind of, on the other side of this cage like that's a kind of whole like movie in itself like who is this thing quarantine like quarantine on the other side yeah it's also amazing because i feel it's a way of finding your world in that other world right yeah. like it's like you and i feel you do that with objects too. it's like you can look at a group of objects and sort of make yourself at home in the in a normal world if we want to call a kind of mainstream mm. movie a normal world by carving out some sort of object space for yourself or some right it, you know yeah like, yeah or i mean i think you just yeah the joy of watching movies for me has always been about that, the, that that screen offers you this sort of place to escape, but it also rem reminds you that that place is, is made from the physical space that you're in too, so that there's the bridge, you know, that, that th whatever's happening in the film is, is, is that, that capacity is here and now too. It's within my reach. And not in a poltergeist way, but that mm -hmm. it is within my reach, you know. Right. You yeah. can actually like meet, meet that, that vision halfway. Mm -hmm. Or more than halfway. Yeah. I think uh, on that note of being within reach from the meat cave. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, 
thank you, Alex and Charlie, so much. Um, thanks. Man. It was really, really nice to talk. And thanks, thanks so for much. having us. Dialogues is produced by David Zwerner. You can find out more about the artists on this series by going to davidswerner.com slash dialogues. And if you liked what you heard, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It really does help other people discover the show. I'm Lucas Werner. Thanks so much for listening, and I hope you join us again next time.